right, so um, welcome to our first uh, 271 lecture. All right, so nice to have you all back yeah, after a long break. Okay, so um, we, the last I checked, we have about 93 uh, registered students. Okay, I think there are still some who are trying to register. Okay, and uh, haven't settled some of the tutorial or lab uh, allocation yet. All right, but roughly, I think we should be within a hundred, okay, as a total enrollment. Okay, so uh, today's, uh, I mean, all lectures are online as I already uh, announced to you all. Okay, tutorials will also be online, uh, labs will be physical. Okay, so I'll be explaining more of that in the module and uh, what to expect. Okay, so let me get started. All right. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, so let's uh, get started. Okay, so I think most of you uh, have either been my students for EVP1 or EVP2, or you have seen me around in the lab. Okay, uh, so this is my office, uh, but um, I don't, uh, I mean, most of us are not going back to office all the time. And even uh, when I go back, uh, for now it is for EPP1, which is on uh, Tuesdays and Thursday um, afternoon slot. Okay, so even though this is my office, I won't usually be there. So if you uh, really need to see me physically to discuss something or about a project or anything, Okay, please uh, try to schedule it either on Tuesdays or Thursdays, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. So that is where I have my uh, EPP class at DSA lab. All right, so you can let me know and then I can just bring you into the conference room there to have a discussion, okay, if you need to see me. All right, other than that, uh, besides this slot, uh, if other times you want to have a meeting or anything, you just let me know through email or through WhatsApp. Okay, most students will directly WhatsApp me, okay, uh, to either ask questions or fix up an appointment or anything. All right, so you're free to do that. Okay, so once uh, yeah, to consult me or anything, please uh, WhatsApp me first. All right, then uh, we can fix up an appointment and then have a discussion. All right. Um, yeah, so my general area of interest is in embedded systems, robotics, and so on. All right, and prior to switching to academics, I was with HP Singapore for quite a while okay, before switching over. All right, so um, I think that's about it for myself. Um, okay, so teaching assistants. All right, so we have a big bunch of teaching assistants this time around. Okay, so the main person, that is going to help me with uh, some of the, the management stuff with Sean. So some of you may know him. He's actually, uh, yeah, I think the very first batch or second batch of students who went through the EPP when we revamped it. Okay, so he's just graduated and he's joined us back as a graduate tutor plus doing his PhD. Okay, so he's going to help me to oversee. So he's uh, the senior senior. The rest of the students that you see here, you may have seen them around, okay, in the DSA lab, uh, maybe one of the last semesters, or maybe they were your TA for EPP. All right, so we have four TAs for the labs and three TAs for the tutorial. Okay, I know sometimes the luminous photo doesn't do justice to how you look now, but too bad that is the photo I can currently access. All right. Okay, course components. Okay, so. Lectures we will have uh, almost every week, all right? Uh, probably the only week where we won't have a lecture is on the midterm week, all right? Because the midterm will be scheduled to be uh, conducted during the lecture slot. Okay, so besides that, uh, every uh, all the other weeks you will have classes, two hours a week. Tutorials, we have uh, nine, and labs plus the project. Okay, so this assessment uh, breakdown uh, I say subject to change, okay, so I'm still trying to, to figure out uh, where to put some of the things. So uh, there is attendance for tutorial and lab, okay, so I, I need to update some of this. So I'll update you all, okay, with the latest uh, uh, sort of breakdown, but roughly this is it, uh, roughly this is it. So 
is around there, probably just maybe a few percent shift here, shift there, and so on. Okay, but roughly this is it. So the exam is 40%, that is fixed. Okay, then the rest of it will probably shift around a bit here and there. Okay, but general assessment breakdown is this. Okay, so when is your final exam? Okay, this is of course an important question. Okay, that you need to know. So uh, I think yeah, in Luminous, if you check your Luminous, uh, they do give you this examination date. Okay, so from what I see, or what is currently updated is 2nd of December, 9 to 11. I think you can see this for all your modules. All right, so I do not know whether this is finalized or is subject to change, but you could probably expect it to be either this date or around this date if there are any last minute changes. Okay, so this should give you an idea of uh, when your final exam is going to be. Okay, in most of the semesters, 2 to 7 one happens to be always towards the tail end. All right, so it's one of the last few papers you will take. All right. And uh, exam format, uh, yeah, ever since COVID came, it has been online. Uh, this semester will also be online. Okay. Um, again, I, I, I just want to, I think most of us still want to be a bit cautious, all right, because like there's been a roller coaster, right? All right, with, with COVID, huh? suddenly two, five, eight, back to two, and so on. So things are always changing. All right. So even though we hope for the best, I think it's better to be a bit more cautious. So I will still plan for an online exam. Same thing for your midterm will also be online. Okay, so that is the current plan. We will stick with that plan unless uh, there is a major change and NUS wants everybody to come back to physical, then we will change. All right, but as long as NUS side, there is still flexibility, then we will, I will keep it as online. Okay. Okay, so the schedule, uh, I've updated it in the Luminous as well, okay? And it's a bit different from your slides because I realized that I actually overrun this before. I had two week sevens and so on. So I, I made a mistake with the numbering and the date. So I re-looked at it. Okay, so this updated one, this slides I will send to you all again. And at the same time, this schedule is also updated in Luminous. All right. Uh, so important thing uh, is, Next week is uh, your lab starts, okay? But next week's lab is more to just collect and do some basic setup, all right? To make sure everything is correct. So there is no attendance, okay? So for next week, there is no attendance, okay? But of course, uh, you need to collect the board. So either you can collect it, okay? Or you can collect it for your team uh, if uh, you already... Uh, want somebody to do it for you. Okay, so I will update you all on this later on. Okay, how to collect the bots and what to do with the bots. Right, but other than that, the schedule is more or less uh, what we have been following the last few uh, semesters. All right, and your midterm is currently scheduled for week 10, that means 18th to 22nd October. Okay, and since the midterm is during our lecture slot, there is no issue of it being, uh, of, of it clashing with any other module, okay? okay? So along the way, if you have questions, uh, you can put in the chat or you can unmute and ask me as well, okay? Now, uh, important thing, uh, even though we have week 13 and uh, you have your project running, uh, this is important for you to take note. Week 13, which is your last week, is the project assessment week. Okay, so you do not have that week to still do last minute changes because your robot needs to be submitted at the start of your lab session. Okay, similar to how you did assessment for EPP. Okay, that means if you are the 8 a.m. class, you submit your robot at 8 a.m. Everybody. Okay, if you are 10 a.m. class, then everybody will submit the robot at 10 a.m. And then we will schedule you a particular time slot to come in and do the assessment. So you do not consider week 13 as still a week to do work. Okay, uh, so you have to make sure that you try to finish up everything by week 12. Okay, so this is important. And another important thing that you must also remember uh, is the DSA lab, uh, ever since COVID started, we are not allowed to have 
open or free access. Okay, so which means that the only slot you have to work on it is during your two hour lab time. Okay, uh, so you need to make full use of it very productively. All right, then only you can make sure you are progressing uh, at the right pace. Okay, so of course, the only other alternative sort of lab space you have is the maker's lab, all right, in SOC. Uh, but that also, I think, because of the current restriction, there is some uh, booking that you need to do in advance. Okay, so if you're not very sure, you can just drop by at the makers okay, when you're free, okay, or you know, uh, contact them through their Facebook page and uh, try to figure out how to book your slot. So if you want to use the facilities there, you can go ahead and do it also. Okay, but you need to make sure you book in advance. Okay, so that is for week 13. So just be mindful of this. You do not consider week 13 as still an additional week to still do last minute work. You have to plan to finish everything by week 12. Okay, after that, you still have week 13, but you do not have access to the lab. Okay, so that is important. Okay, so the other days of the week, Monday to Thursday, you know it is fully utilized by EPP. Okay, so you don't have time then. Friday afternoon, there is currently, I don't think there is any uh, module using the lab. Okay, but because of the current situation, I do not know whether there is going to be any open access or free access. Okay, I will talk to Uncle Jalil, okay, and, and update y'all if there is any change in their policy. Okay. Okay, so the curriculum is, um, okay, so before, a few years ago, it was different. Okay, it was Arduino Uno. Uh, it was just very basic hardware, switches, LEDs, and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so when I took over, I felt it was very, it was not doing justice to the students, all right, because I think you all are a lot more smarter, a lot more capable, all right, uh, after seeing you all in EPP, all right, so definitely uh, you all can achieve a lot more, all right, so that's why I revamped the module, okay, so uh, it is still evolving. Uh, in fact, your batch is a new, is going to try out something new for the first time also, I'll show you in a while. Okay, so it is still an evolving module. Okay, uh, so I will keep uploading the material weekly. So I do not want you to be overwhelmed uh, with everything at the same time. Okay, so I'll upload the material on a weekly basis. Okay, uh, so generally by Friday night or Saturday night, I should upload it. Okay, but if you do not see it, then uh, please uh, email me. Okay, then I, I will look into it. All right. Okay, so textbook, there is no particular reference text. I think there is a lot of, uh, the material I provide is more than enough, okay? And there's also a lot of online resources available, okay? For, for you to, to look into, okay? So I don't uh, recommend any reference text in particular. Okay, the tutorial will start from week three, okay? Attendance will be marked, okay? So uh, this, Participation and volunteering, I will, I will update you all again. Okay, so like I said, the breakdown of marks, okay, I will look into it and I will update you all uh, by announcement. All right, and uh, feedback channel is always open. So you are encouraged to communicate freely with your tutor or with me. All right, and uh, we will release the tutorials usually by the end of the week. Okay, uh, I have some video recordings of previous tutorials, which I will also send you all the links. All right, uh, and I will also get your tutors to send you all the recording links. Okay, from your own tutorial session. Okay, if, if that is uh, more uh, applicable to, to your experience, all right. Okay, so lab arrangement. So this one is important. So the first thing is the board, all right. So from, uh, um, sorry, from the Arduino Uno, okay, we have uh, jumped many levels up to now dealing with a ARM Cortex M0 Plus process, a processor core. It's a 32 bit processor, so it's a very high end processor, okay, very powerful board that you are given, all right, uh, to, to explore in this module, okay. Uh, to do the labs and the projects, you need to form a team, okay. So previously, I had two member teams, but I think the workload is a bit heavy, 
So now I am making it a bit better. So it's either three or four, and preferably four. Okay. So if you already have some friends that you want to partner, you can go ahead. So I'm not going to assign you all. You all form your own teams. All right. Uh, but the important thing is the team must be from in, in the same lab. Okay, must be from the same lab slot. Okay, that means if you belong to the B01, you, your team must be formed from members within that slot only. Same thing, if you're from B02, you must only form a team from members within that slot. Okay, so you cannot form team from with students across different lab slots. Okay, so that is the only restriction. Other than that, you are free to form a team with anybody you like. Okay, so along the way, uh, certain labs will have demo requirements. Okay, that means, and there are marks for this as well. So you need to demonstrate certain things. Okay, so not to be worried, it is not that you are expected to do it within the two hours and demo it by the end of the two hours. So it's not like that. So if, for example, if this week's lab is on interrupts, all right, and we are trying to write some code for that, then the demonstration for that will be the following week only. Okay, so you can still use that lab plus that one additional week to work on your code, okay, work on your hardware, and then do the demo the following week. All right, so you don't need to submit any report or anything, but just do a demo. All right, and the TA might just ask you some questions related to the demo. Okay, and that's all. Okay, so there is no report, there's nothing as long as you can demonstrate that functionality that is mentioned in your lab manual, that is fine. Okay, uh, there's only one report that you would, might be required to submit. So, but this again, like I said, some of the things that I put here are still in uh, transition mode okay so some of the things i'm changing to make it more meaningful okay some uh, things that i'm removing that i feel that is not really necessary okay so the report i may be removing it okay from the final submission all right so i will update you all along the way okay so project okay so the items will be issued starting from week two okay so when i say items okay uh, you each team will be given a sort of goodie bag, okay, with everything that you need to do. All right. So I think before that, maybe let's take a break from this and look at the video. Okay. So this is a video from your seniors, okay, uh, who did it I think two batches ago. Okay. So I'll just play, and uh, if you can't hear the audio, please let me know. Okay, in the chat.
Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that video. So that uh, video is part of your requirement, okay, for the project. So each team is required to upload a two to three minute video, okay. So again, all of this, I'm just telling you in advance only, okay. Uh, you will probably be working on it uh, along the way, okay. But I think the video part uh, is good for you to know now so that the moment you start collecting your toolkit and you start putting things together, um, uh, you can um, start taking your own photos, videos, and you know, start to, to prepare your material along the way. Okay, so that is why you need to know about the video. Then you have a leaderboard ranking as well as part of your assessment. Okay, that means uh, based on the challenge run, uh, where do you stand amongst all your other teams? Okay, all your peers. Uh, so that leaderboard ranking will uh, have uh, some marks, okay? And then you have a checklist as well. Okay, so later I'll be going through that checklist. Okay, uh, so there is, uh, some of you are messaging, asking me about uh, team forming, okay? So if you are unable to form a team, all right? So I will give you some time first, okay? So I will be uh, giving you some time to, look around, ask your friends, okay? And see if you can form a team. For those students who are unable to form a team by the end of week two, okay, that means by the end of next week, okay? I will uh, gather your names and from there, I will just assign you all, okay? To groups, okay? For those who are unable to form a team. All right, so don't worry, you won't get a team, okay? But I'm giving, the option for you all to form your own team first, all right? If you really are unable to do it, then I will form for you all, all right? No problem, okay? Uh, in terms of the RTOS that you'll be learning, it is the RTX RTOS, okay? So we will be uh, sort of uh, learning about this in the later half of the module. All right, um, yeah, so the, I think the most exciting part of this module is actually the project, all right, because you really get to see uh, it, whatever you are learning being applied in the real world challenge, all right? Uh, and unlike, uh, I think in EPP, though we also uh, have the same concept, in EPP, you are sort of, uh, uh, sort of guided, in many, many steps, correct? And you just have to follow through to put things together. What else here? There is, the, the lab manuals are designed to help you, to guide you, to uh, make sure you understand the, the, the concepts, all right? And of course, the initial part, the hardware and all, there's a bit more help, okay? But later on, when it comes to the overall uh, RTOS implementation and the architecture design, it is very much on your own, okay? For you all to decide and plan how you want to do it. All right, so there's a lot more uh, applied learning here. All right, and I think even if you look at the feedback from many students, they really enjoy the uh, project element of this module. Okay, so I hope you also enjoy it as much as your peers did in the past. All right, and like I mentioned, all the TAs that are with you are all recent batch of students, which means they have all done the same project. Okay, so they will also be able to share with you tips and strategies you know, what goes wrong, what doesn't go wrong, you know, how to plan for things and so on, all right? So again, this course, uh, yeah, in fact, I, yeah, we are, we're thinking of changing the name actually, uh, but we haven't done it yet, all right? So even though it's called real-time operating systems, I think it is, uh, it's more of an embedded real-time systems, all right? So yeah, we might go through a name change sometime, you know, in the future. So in this module, basically, uh, it is structured such that in the first half of it, you will learn about this new microcontroller, learn about the development of it, okay, the peripherals and so on. Okay, and why this is important? Because I think there's not enough exposure for our CG students in this low level embedded design. And I do not know of any other module that is actually filling this gap. Uh, even in EPP1 and EPP2, I think uh, 
most of the students, in most cases, you rely a lot on uh, a library code, okay, to, to get things done. And even though we try to go through some low level stuff, uh, I think it's still too little. Okay, uh, and there's still a lot more to learn. So uh, this module, okay, this first few weeks is to bridge that gap to understand a more detailed uh, appreciation of uh, the low level hardware, All right? And then we move on to OS. We talk about processes, scheduling, inter-process communication and all this other stuff, all right? And then you put everything together and you create that project. Okay, so uh, learning material. Okay, so this, I've been using this website for a while. Okay, uh, if you go to the link that I said, I said before, all the previous uh, lectures, everything is also sort of dumb there. Okay, uh, but of course, uh, recently I saw, felt that it's a bit too cluttered with too much of information everywhere. So I'm, I'm working on another website, okay, which I also sent to you where I'm trying to arrange things a bit more uh, in a structured manner. And I'm also going to be creating short videos. Okay, so instead of uh, no, I will also send you all, all the video recordings on a weekly basis. Uh, I think in some cases, uh, short video just explaining a particular concept might be a bit more effective. All right, so uh, that is also a part of the aim of, of branching out to a different website. Okay, and uh, all my videos, everything I put on my channel, okay, which you can also subscribe or you can go to the link below here. Okay, so again, why we want to move away and move in this direction okay from in the past is because i think in the last few years uh, there is also a lot of uh, i would say a lot of improvement a lot of uh, hype okay and excitement about processors uh, architecture and companies merging together and so on all right uh, apple coming up with their own uh, silicon all right uh, nvidia trying to uh, merge with ARM and things like that, okay? Uh, so it, it has become quite an exciting time, okay, for computer engineering in general, all right? Uh, so I think moving away from Arduino towards ARM, okay, is something that is beneficial for you, all right? Uh, so when you, you know, complete the module and you, you know, update, update your LinkedIn profile and say that you are an expert in ARM, okay, I think it, it will help your, your your profile a lot, okay, to say that you have this exposure and this experience in this uh, platform, all right? Uh, of course, uh, as computer engineers, uh, and if you look at Singapore in general, all right, uh, a lot of exciting things are happening, all right? Uh, everything is going towards, I mean, though there's always hype about uh, uh, big data and AI and all these things, all right? Uh, all of that backend stuff, only helps you make decisions, all right? Eventually, somebody has to carry out the action, okay? So that action, okay, interpreting the decision and carrying out action is where the engineering part comes in, okay? So computer engineers are always in this very nice sweet spot because you understand the software aspect and you also know how to integrate the hardware aspect, okay? So that puts you in a very good position, all right? When you talk about uh, not only Singapore, many countries moving towards smart nation, moving towards uh, electric vehicles, all right? Uh, and, you know, and, and not only these things, but right? even you talk about uh, energy, all right? Uh, agriculture, water, okay? So everywhere there are systems involved where experts like yourself can have a lot of uh, opportunity. All right, so it's an exciting time, I think, for computer engineers, all right, when you graduate, uh, to, to enter or even start up your own, you know, and explore. Okay, so uh, before we move ahead, okay, I would like to do a simple poll. So I, I uh, starting to use this uh, poll everywhere, and I hope you have used this as well. So you can go to this link, all right, and then you can start to uh, respond to the poll, okay? So the first one is, C programming, okay, from your own uh, perspective, okay, uh, how good is your C programming? Okay, so you can answer honestly, okay, I'm not uh, going to track who said what.
Okay, so there's still quite a about 20 over students who haven't replied yet. Okay, never mind. All right. So I think generally most of you are in the okay, okay range, which is good. Okay, those of you in the last 12%, I would think you're just trying to be funny. Okay. Uh, okay, so this module, okay, C programming is heavily used, correct, uh, both in the first half and second half. Okay, so it is the fundamental programming knowledge, okay, for computer engineers, right, because almost all uh, embedded platforms uh, are very much uh, running on C, okay, and C compilers. All right, so you need to make sure that your C programming is, is uh, I mean, you don't need to be expert, but as long as all your basic concepts are there, then I think shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so we will be using C programming heavily, okay, in this module. Okay, so some of you did not take CS1010. So if you did not take CS1010, okay, uh, then you need to sort of pick up some aspect of C, okay, for this module, all right. Uh, okay, so this is a basic requirement here, all right? You need to program in C. So if you did not take CS1010, but you took something else, that, then I think you, you have to sort of uh, quickly do some pick up, all right, and uh, maybe work together with your teammates, all right, and, uh, and make sure that you are able to uh, fulfill the project requirements, okay? Okay, so the next one is hardware development. So I talk about hardware development, things like uh, breadboard, soldering, Okay, uh, wire wrapping, connecting components together, stuff like that. Okay, so I think most of you are in a, okay, you know, uh, okay, okay, or good or very good. Okay, so the, the those who use eye power before, I think it's time to use some hand power. Right, uh, because uh, like I said, there are only very few modules where you get a chance to do this. Okay, you get a chance to learn this. All right, so uh, if you have always been afraid of doing hardware, I think now is the time to, to get uh, get things moving. All right, and, 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 and make, get yourself more confident. All right, so it is not that difficult. All right, you just need to learn, practice, okay, the, the hardware part. There will be some soldering that you need to do. Okay, there will be some all the connections, the wiring, okay, hardware, physical stuff. Okay, like what you saw uh, in the video just now. All right. So of course, if uh, in your team, all right, if there is already somebody who is very good in hardware and wants to do it, that is that is fine. Okay, but I think if you are not good, it's also good. At, uh, it's a good chance for you to to get out of that that fear and try to get some exposure, all right? Okay, so this module, like I said, has a very good mix of both hardware and software. So you need to do both, okay? So that is where the project team and uh, the cooperation comes in. So uh, as much as possible, okay, try to make sure that you have a team where you know you have, okay, you can complement each other's strengths. Okay, if everybody in the team only wants to do software, nobody wants to even touch the soldering iron, that's it. Okay, very difficult. All right, so there must be some some complement of, of strengths within the team. Okay, to try out and, and get things moving. Okay, if not, you'll be stuck. Okay, so the last one. I mean, I have shared uh, what this module is about. Okay, and what uh, you can possibly uh, gain from this. So what do you hope to learn? Okay, what is your own personal uh, aim and thing from, that you hope to learn from this module when you're taking this? Okay. Okay, hardware, cool stuff, bare metal. 
with a proton saga okay interesting that you chose proton saga hey, sorry yeah everything out of my brain okay that's interesting enough to get employed okay. become tony stark okay um soldering the soldering you will you will do a bit okay okay so thank you thank you for your responses okay so uh like i said this will be a module where you really get to do some cool stuff okay and uh, uh you will enjoy it, okay trust me on that okay it can be a bit stressful at times okay Uh, but i think uh, the learning journey will be definitely something you will enjoy all right and you will cherish all right and uh, whatever you're learning here will definitely uh, sort of bring you up to a higher level all right where you get more confident that you don't need to rely on arduino for everything okay you don't need to rely on library code for everything you can just uh, have the confidence to say i i can pick up any board any microcontroller and i can just go through some some data sheet go through some manual and quickly get things up and running okay so that is again a very very important thing you must learn okay uh, because uh, again like i said that is the one thing that is still lacking uh, that gap is still you know in there in our curriculum and i hope this module will see up okay because when you graduate when you when you want to get a job to just say you know i do you know i tell you it is uh, it will be a big setback if you just say i only know i do you know correct right? you must say that you must have the confidence to say that you can pick up any embedded platform and you can and you can hit the ground running very quickly okay so by learning how to do it in this module i hope you know that that gap is fulfilled all right so again thank you for your responses here okay now uh i'll just want to quickly uh review uh the project specifications all right uh, and then start the next chapter all right so let me uh, let me bring up the project specifications here i uploaded this document uh i think yesterday okay maybe before that maybe i'll just show you the board and uh, what what you going to get okay so this is the board the freedom uh, development board okay can you see the screen freedom development board yes no okay thank you Okay, so this is the freedom board that you will get. Okay, so when you get the board, uh, you will uh, when you unbox it, uh, uh, you will see this. All right, so this is the uh, KL two five Z board. All right, so a few important things. Okay, uh, I will still remind you next week, but I want to tell you now as well. This board is very sensitive. Okay, be very careful not to use your bare hands. okay to touch the top surface or the bottom surface of this board okay uh, is very sensitive because our fingers always have static all right so any uh, any uh, any time okay uh, if your fingers are a bit damp or anything or there's a high amount of static it can damage the boards all right so please be very careful when handling the board always touch it by the side okay and uh, so this is the front side this is the back side of the board okay when you collect the board okay you will not come i will give you this connector separately okay so you need to solder them all right so 
when you solder the boards, okay, as you can see, you need to solder it very uh, closely and very carefully. Okay, um, if your soldering is not good, okay, I will strongly encourage you to get help from other classmates who are more confident with soldering. Okay, so this is important because if your soldering is not done correctly, uh, two things can happen. One thing, you may create short circuit, okay, between the adjacent legs, okay, all right, that is one thing. And the other thing is, if you, again, your soldering is not good and you apply the soldering iron for too long, okay, you can damage the board. Okay, so it is very important, okay, that this soldering is done correctly, okay. Uh, if you are not confident, please seek help, okay, you can ask a friend, doesn't matter, same team or other team, doesn't matter. Soldering, just ask anybody you know to help you with, with the soldering part, okay, because if that one goes wrong, your whole board can be damaged. All right, and I don't want, do not want that. All right, so that is the first thing. Okay, please be very careful uh, when you are dealing with the board. All right, uh, be, make sure your hands are dry. Okay, and always touch it from the side. Only do not touch the top part of it or the, the bottom part of it. Okay, and it comes inside this uh, sort of uh, electrostatic uh, plastic. So always keep it stored within the plastic itself. All right, to protect the board, Okay, uh, one option you, you can think of is to 3D print a casing uh, on your own. Okay, so uh, last two patches, there was some problem because uh, of the limited access to the maker's lab. I think this round may be a bit better. All right, so you can uh, 3D print, okay, up to you. But make sure when you 3D print, you make sure that they, you still have access to all the port pins plus the power, the two USB power socket here. Okay, and then uh, you should be able to maybe better protect your board. Okay, now on top of that, okay, like I said, uh, this is a uh, ever-changing module. So in this batch, you are the first one to also get another, see, it gets more exciting, right? Okay, you're going to get another microcontroller board. Okay, so you all are considered lucky. Okay, why are you considered lucky? Because this second microcontroller board for your batch, I'm just using it as a Wi-Fi module. So this is a ESP32 chip. Okay, and we're going to use that mainly just for Wi-Fi connectivity. All right, uh, why I say you're lucky? Because the next batch is going to have another RTOS running on the ESP32. Okay, but for your batch, I decided not to do that first. Okay, so next batch, you will have two bots with two OS talking to each other. Okay, your batch is just two bots, but only one OS, the other one is just Wi-Fi. All right. Uh, so this other bot is a new bot I just introducing to y'all, uh, y'all are the first batch. Okay, where uh, you're going to use it for Wi-Fi. Okay, previously we had another chip for Bluetooth. Okay, but I think uh, quite a few batch of students had uh, uh, issues with the Bluetooth connectivity. So uh, that's why now I changed to this Wi-Fi module. All right, so I will be sharing information on how to do all of this. Okay, so don't need to worry. Huh? So the setup, the integration, everything, uh, you will actually go through step by step in each lab. Okay, so you will not be just done with it and you're left on your own. No, we are going to guide you through the process. Okay, but like I said, you need to keep up with every week's lab so that you know exactly what's going on and you start to put things together, everything falls in place. Okay, so that is, those are the two bots you will receive plus on top of that, all the other stuff. Okay, so if you remember the video, the chases, the motors, the wheels, the motor driver, all of that stuff. I guess all of that you will receive in, in the goodie bag next week. Okay, so um, okay, I think what you will do is you will take a short five minutes break. All right. Uh, and then when we come back, I will talk about the product specifications as well as uh, the next chapter. Okay, so let's go for a short break. Now it's 9.54. I think about 10 o'clock, I'll see you all back here. Okay, let's carry on by looking at the project 
specifications first okay okay so uh, another thing is um, if at any point of time uh, due to network uh, i get disconnected okay just stay in the zoom call all right uh, basically zoom will randomly assign one of you to become the host okay so just wait while i get reconnected and then i will i will uh, you'll be able to carry on after that okay if uh, it ever happens okay uh, not only for this lesson for any any of the future lessons as well okay uh can everybody see the screen i'm sharing okay thank you all right so this is the uh, uh product specification uh, again i will usually up update it along the way uh, to add maybe clarification um, or certain changes that is not done and so on, so on okay so don't don't go and print out anything at the moment just keep it as a reference and i will update it along the way all right uh, so basically i think from the um, video already you have an idea of uh, what your project is supposed to do all right uh, the requirements checklist is basically to make sure that your robot is able to fulfill uh, the basic level of uh, functionality okay so we will go through the wi-fi connectivity the motor control the led control and so on all right and the audio control okay so these are basically specific functions okay so for example if we talk about wi-fi you must be able to establish wi-fi connection all right successfully all right and uh, you must be able to respond the robot must be able to respond with specific led uh, blinking and so on okay uh, motor control is very basic okay moving in all four directions performing curve turns and so on okay. uh, led control okay so the you'll be given two different uh, sort of led uh, panels where you are supposed to uh, bling them in a specific pattern okay depending on the direction in which you're moving okay so if you look at all these requirements that we have you will see that your robot has to do a lot of things at the same time okay play song move establish wi-fi connection keep on uh, getting incoming commands and so on all right then you will also play a song all right, so uh, this song, you are free to choose any tune that you like. Okay, uh, a few batches ago, the very first time that we did this, I fixed the tone at uh, Baby Shark. And I think by the end of the module, everybody was sick and tired of Baby Shark. Okay, so I decided this time, let's, uh, after that, I decided not to fix the song anymore. All right, and then um, we can uh, choose whatever song, but of course, it must be a proper song. So you need to play the actual song and sort of show that the, the tune that you're playing matches a, a real song. Okay. Uh, then uh, there's also this new thing that was started last batch. Okay. This self-driving ability. All right. That means uh, though you, okay, so in the video, you what you saw was two batches ago where you have a remote control through the app. All right. But uh, in this second challenge that was recently introduced last batch, uh, you also have the self-driving ability all right, where you can just go at a particular distance and come back. All right, so I will tell a bit more in a while. Okay, so this RTOS part all, we will leave it first. Okay, when we are covering RTOS, you can uh, we'll come back to this. Okay, the challenge run. Okay, so this challenge run sequence that you see here is basically what you saw in the video. Okay, uh, is the same route, same place, okay, no difference. That means from outside uh, uh, Uncle Jalil's side, the office there, you will start, then you will place two ramps, one when you're going up, and then you will go around the cone, go through, go around. Then you have a second ramp as well, and then you have a S shape. Uh, obstacle and then you go back all right so that is the remote control mode of it that means the challenge run one okay where you're supposed to go and uh, do this and the fastest timing will of course get the leaderboard 
but at the same time, there's of course penalty marks uh, if you fall off the ramp or you hit the cones and things like that. Okay, that is your challenge run one, okay, that you saw in the video. The challenge run two is basically the self-driving mode, all right? So it is not a very uh, complicated self-driving. Basically, you will place an obstacle at a fixed distance and you should be able to go towards the obstacle, detect it, go around it and come back. Okay, go around it and come back and you need to be able to uh, do this in the fastest time, all right, without hitting the obstacle. All right. Um, so that is the second challenge. All right. Now for this second challenge, okay, and, and for the project in general, okay, each team is given a budget of $50. Okay, to purchase additional components. All right. Um, so you need to decide how you want to achieve this object detection. All right, uh, but the important thing is this whole challenge one and challenge two, the code, the uh, software architecture, everything should be done only on the KL25Z board. Okay, you cannot use the ESP32 or another microcontroller to do this. Okay, everything has to be contained within the ARM controller board. All right, so that is the idea of challenge run one and challenge run two. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, so the obstacle, yeah, so I've already given this now itself, so you have time to prepare. Okay, in the last batch, I went to buy those soccer cones from Decathlon and uh, use that as obstacle. Okay, but I think we have a lot of uh, uh, diehard soccer fans or soccer players, and so the cones kept disappearing. All right, so to save myself the hassle, I decided that you all make your own obstacle. All right, um, so you make the obstacle by using four toilet rolls taped together, okay, to form this square shape. And the diagonal of it should be roughly around 10.10 10 to 11 cm. All right, so this will ensure that you make your own obstacle, you take care of your own obstacle, and everybody is consistent. Okay, and uh, you are free, okay, to cover the obstacle with any type of paper or color. Okay, if you think that by using black color paper, I can detect it better, then you go ahead and cover it with black. Okay, if it's red color paper, you use red. So that is up to you, that is fine. Okay, so you just make sure that your sensor, okay, and your software works well with your obstacle. The size of the obstacle is, is given already. So you just create it using four toilet rolls. I think it's, it's doable. Okay, so this again, I'm just giving you some heads up on the, the project. Okay, uh, so you have an idea of what we are moving towards. Okay, we will come back to this uh, document and the updated version later on. All right, but this is just to give you a heads up on uh, on, on, on the eventual direction of the project. Okay, so let me uh, come, come back to our lecture one, okay, to get some basic fundamentals on, on embedded systems design. Okay, so, Okay, what is an embedded system design? I think you don't need any introduction on that, right? Basically, whatever you did in EPP1, whether it's MBOT or EPP2, the search and rescue robot, all of them are embedded system designs, right? And of course, it doesn't have to be a movable object, right? It could be uh, even a simple uh, aircon remote control or a TV remote control. That is also an embedded system, right? Why? Because it is a computing platform with a specific application uh, focus, all right? So we, we think of embedded systems as any computing platform in general that has been designed for a specific purpose, okay? Whereas a laptop, in a sense, or a computer, we say it's a general purpose computing platform, all right? Um, yeah, if you take handphone, okay? 
I mean, originally you can say it was uh, the the first generation and second generation. You can say it's an embedded system, but now it is becoming also more and more like a a generic computing platform because you can almost do everything with it. Okay, so it is sort of an evolving platform where it started off as an embedded platform because originally you just make calls, receive SMS, and so on. Okay, but now it is evolved. Okay, so it is sort of an in between uh, system. Right. Uh, so the whole idea is you want to, uh, when, you, when you say you want to create an embedded system, you want to introduce the computing power of a microcontroller into the system. All right. You don't necessarily need to have an embed uh, microcontroller in all systems. Okay. In some cases, maybe just some simple hardware put together can solve the problem. You know, uh, so it's not necessary that you always need to have a microcontroller, you need software to run it. Okay, but if you're going to do it, then you must be able to understand what is the advantage of doing it. All right. Uh, of course, what are the options? Okay, so again, the basic simple option is to use discrete logic. That means I put together my logic gates, my op amps, my sensors, my capacitor, inductors, and so on. Put them together and, and create a, a circuit. Okay, they can be very low cost, very easy. All right, uh, and I can quickly get it up and running. All right. The other more common aspect that most people will do is the microcontroller. Okay, so when you say microcontroller, it's like, uh, I mean, now you're going to learn ARM. Uh, what you're probably more familiar with is the Arduino. Correct. So when you talk about Arduino. You think of it as a single chip solution. All right, that means everything is internal to it. All right, uh, it already has its own clock, its own memory, its own GPIO, everything built in. You just write some code, connect up the hardware as you want, and you have a system that's working. All right, uh, so that is microcontroller. Okay, uh, in in uh, in bigger organizations, maybe they'll want to go with a microprocessor option. Okay, in microprocessor option means what? That means you start with a processor core and then you build the peripherals and everything else around it to create your own baseline platform. Because of this, of course, it requires a fair amount of resources and money to, 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 to allocate okay? and, 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 and uh, schedule as well. Okay, so if you want something very quickly up and running, then you go with a microcontroller. All right? But if you want to design something on your own, then you go with the microprocessor option. Okay. In other cases, you may go with the FPGA option. Okay. Uh, I think you will learn FPGA. Uh, kind of the model. I think it's three seven. Uh, I can't remember what module code that is. Okay. But there's one module where you will learn, or maybe you might have be taking it in this semester as well. Okay. Where you will learn about uh, HDL hardware description language. Okay, so in HDL, hardware description language, you will either learn Verilog or VHDL, and you will learn how to write software that will generate hardware. Okay, so it's a very interesting module, very interesting concept, because when you generally write software, okay, like when you write your C programming, whether it's for your ARPA, your Arduino, or the ARM, whatever, you are writing software instructions, Okay, so every microprocessor, okay, or every processor call basically goes through three fundamental cycles, correct, which is called FDE, fetch, decode, and execute. Okay, so the whole idea is you fetch the instruction, it decodes your instruction, and executes the instruction. Okay, so that is what a processor does, okay, again and again, okay, based on the code you have written. Okay, where else when you talk about HDL, there are no instructions and nothing to, to, to fetch because the code that you write generates hardware and the hardware will execute. Okay, the moment the, the, the input is applied or the moment the plot comes in and so on. So the, the concept is different. Okay, but it's a very powerful tool because uh, instead of wasting time trying to fetch and execute and decode and execute instruction, you can very quickly process 
we input the moment it arrives. Okay, so in terms of response, it can be very, very fast. Okay, FPGA, all right, but again, it is still an expensive solution because the hardware is expensive. All right, so generally FPGAs in the industry is used to design hardware. Okay, in fact, most processor cores are first designed in HDL first. Correct. So you use HDL code to design processor cores. And once you finalize the processor core, then you customize and make it an ASIC. Okay, so that means you sort of fix the design and you make an IC chip out of it. All right, and that chip now becomes the processor core. You know? So ASIC is used when your FPGA code is already fixed and you know this is the final design and you want to stick with this design. Then you uh, go through the process of converting it into an ASIC. Okay, of course, an ASIC is a very high cost investment. All right. Uh, so you only go in that direction when you know you have like uh, millions of chips to, 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 to produce, then you go in that direction. Okay, nobody goes in the ASIC direction with just 100 chips or 1000 chips. No, okay, you have to go in the millions. All right, so it's a very high volume uh, uh, need, then you go in that direction. All right, so it's all about uh, options that you have. All right, so this is again important for you as a computer engineer, right? Because uh, even though it might seem that using a microcontroller is always the easiest option because that's what you know, but it may not necessarily be the most optimal solution. Okay, so you need to be aware of the options that you have so you can make the most informed decision. So if you take, for example, a simple uh, system like this, a bike performance tracker, right? So if you are into cycling, all right, you want to keep track of your performance, then you can uh, probably have this tracking device that will be able to monitor how fast you are running, what is the speed, and so on, okay? And what's the distance you have covered, okay? So if you look at a system like this, it's a very compact device, low cost, low power consumption, what are the inputs? You probably need to have one sensor fixed to uh, that can monitor your, your wheel rotation, correct? And you probably have one or two buttons, okay, to, to change the mode or things like that. All right, so if you look at a system like this, okay, and you say you want to use the KL25Z to design the system, it is a total waste of money. Okay, why? Because it's an overkill. Okay, you have a, a, a high end, powerful processor, but the application is so simple. Okay, so you need to be able to assess the requirements of the system and then choose the most appropriate device. So in this case, okay, a very simple low cost 8-bit controller is more than enough to fulfill the requirements of the system. Okay, whereas if you go to a ECU, okay, energy control unit of a car, okay, you have so many inputs coming in, okay? So if you look at these inputs, okay? So many of them coming in, all right? And you have a network uh, data coming in as well. And at the same time, you need to make a lot, you need to process all this information and then control the various output elements, the uh, spark plugs, the, the, the engine throttling, all right, the output drivers, the fuel, the, the camshaft, the control, the valves, and so on. So there's so much of input, so much of output, okay, so much of processing that you need to do, okay, and it has to be done very, very quickly in real time mode. All right, so for a system like this, you need a very high end device, okay, with enough memory, enough processing speed. All right, and power to fulfill the requirements. Okay, so you definitely need some high performance controller. Okay, so if you say I use a KL25Z or something like this, then it makes sense. Okay, because of the requirements that you have to fulfill. Okay, so this is uh, this, this, this is for information for you to go and explore. What is Mistra? So you can go and read up on your own. Okay, so Mistra is basically a, a sort of standard for the automotive industry. 
All right. Uh, again, different industries may have their own sort of standard. So MISRA is a standard that is followed, okay, or you have to strictly follow if you are developing uh, software applications for automotive uh, needs. All right. So they have their own rules on what is allowed, what is not allowed. Okay, certain things you can do. Okay, certain things you cannot do, and so on. Okay, so I'll just leave that to you for your own reading. All right. Uh, so again, the whole idea of embedded systems is you want to move towards uh, the ability to lower your cost while enabling more features. All right, and that is what the computing platform does for us. All right. So in most cases, your embedded systems, you might have open loop or closed loop. Okay, so what's the difference between open loop and closed loop is, is basically a matter of whether you are just taking input and controlling an output or you are going to uh, adjust an output based on a desired set point. Okay, so I'm not sure whether you are going to do any control theory based modules. Okay, so the basic or the most uh, primitive control is your PID control. Okay, I think you, some of you may have tried this um, in your EPP2, okay, to try and get your wheels to move more accurately, all right. So, uh, if you don't have a closed loop system, all right, and if you say, I, whenever I press the button, it moves by a certain distance, but you cannot guarantee that distance, correct, okay, because every time you press, maybe, the first time it moves 10 cm, the next time maybe it moves 12 cm. Okay, so there's always some variation. So if I want to make sure that I'm always able to achieve a consistent output, there must be a closed loop. Okay, so that is where you need to put in some wheel encoders or some sensors to detect how much your wheel has rotated, and then you calibrate your motor ac accordingly. So each time, Okay, your motor must be able to stop the moment you hit the desired set point. Okay, so that's open loop and closed loop. All right. Uh, in some cases, you also need to do like signal processing. All right. So in, in our, yeah, for example, if you look back at EPP1, when you had your uh, IR sensors, all right, at the side to navigate straight, you had the color sensor functionality and so on. All right, so in, in the case of EVP, we use the hardware to do the IR sensor detection. All right, but then it senses a signal, it senses some values, all right, and then we process that information to make the decision. All right, communication and networking is what we're going to be doing in our module. Okay, we're going to have the Wi Fi connectivity to talk to our app, all right, and get the necessary commands. So again, these are just some uh, examples. Okay, so this is uh, just to give you an idea of integrating an analog sensor. Okay, so whenever you have a sensor or any analog device that you want to integrate, what must you do? You must first understand the idea of how the analog sensor works. Correct. So the analog sensor itself is going to give us some reading. Okay, and then we have an A to D converter. Okay, if your microcontroller has A to D converter built in, okay, most of them should have, you can make use of that to uh, capture the value. All right, but before you do A to D conversion, okay, there is something else here that you may need to do. Okay, one more step here that we need to do before the sensor reading can go to the A to D converter. Can anybody tell me? In EPP1, we, we sort of covered this, that there's one more thing that you need to do before you can do A to D conversion. Can anybody recall? From EPP1, what is that thing you need to do? Yes, no.
Okay, so let me give you a, a, a hint of what you need to do. If your sensor, okay, let's say your, your think of it as maybe your Arduino Uno's A to D converter. So your Arduino Uno A to D converter has a range of 0 volt to 5 volt. Correct. If I look at the sensor here, this output sensor here is also going from 0 volt to 5 volt. Okay, so no problem. But what if, what if your sensor that you are dealing with is only going from zero volt to one volt? The maximum is one, the minimum is zero. Now what's the problem? Okay, so yeah, it's about how you relate, correct, the input to the output. Okay, so like, yeah, benchmarking how much pressure tallies to how much voltage. So that is basically your, uh, the range, correct? That means the scaling that you need to do to match the input to the range of the ADC. You can still go ahead, okay, if my input sensor is zero to one volt and I still use the A to D converter as it is without doing any other uh, conditioning, it still works. But what happens is all the A to D values will be only within the lower end. So they all will squeeze towards the lower end of the output range. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to bump this up to 5 volts. So that is why here what we need to do is usually what we call we have an amplification stage. Okay, the general term is signal conditioning. Okay, we say we do signal conditioning before we pass it to the A to D. All right, but in this particular example, we say it is amplification. Okay, that means I want to make sure that the range of the input matches the range of the A to D converter. Okay, so this is actually one of the things that is covered in our EPP1. All right, this concept. So this amplification is to match. So what happens is if I'm able to bump up the range from zero to one up to zero to five, then when a sensor signal comes in, I will be able to get the full range of ADC values. So I can get a more accurate representation of my uh, input data. Okay, so this is again, things we need to be careful about. We need to be aware. All right, so you need to look at the input range, the sensor, the, the, the range of voltages or current that it provides, and then design any additional circuit that we need okay, before we do the A to D conversion. Okay, so that is one thing. Now, another thing. In this example here, it is a very nice straight line. So all you need to do is look at the gradient, and based on the gradient, I can directly map the output and the input. Okay, no problem. Okay, it's, it's easy for us to do. But what if the relationship, okay, let's say if I draw the output and the input here. If this is the output and this is the input. Okay, what, is the, what if the relationship is something like this? Something non-linear, all right, and with different sort of characteristic, okay, uh, or the, the relationship keeps changing, okay, for different range of input. Then, what do I do? How do I come up with a, a code to represent the relationship between the input and output? Okay, if it's a straight line, no problem. It's very easy, all right? But if it is something like this, a very funny shape, what do you do? Any suggestion? Any thoughts on what you can do to solve this? Sample as in, as in what? You are, you're going to sample the data. Correct, you're going to sample the data, but you're sampling the input, correct? After you sample the input, 
Your software is the one that generates the output equivalent. Fit the data into a graph and find the equation. Okay, so that, that is the problem here, correct? Because this is not a standard graph, it's not a linear, it's not a quadratic. All right. So divide into segments, okay? Yes, that is a possible solution. All right, so what you can do is what we call, you can divide the graph into piecewise segment. That means you can say that I split the graph. Okay, into different segments. And then each segment here has a different equation. This is equation one, equation two, equation three, equation four, and so on. Okay, so if my input fall within this particular range, I use equation one. If it falls between another range, I use another equation and so on. Okay, so you can split up your data, all right, and use different equations to represent different type of input. Okay. Of course, you can of if you have a lot of memory to spare, you can just create a lookup table in your code as well. All right. You can just create a lookup table to store all possible input values and have the corresponding output value. Okay, so that is also possible. All right. You have a lot of memory to spare. You know what to do, you create a lookup table. So it's possible. Okay, or you can do this method as well. So you need to think of what is the sort of ideal solution uh, that you can implement given the information that you have. Okay, so this is uh, just to highlight a common thing. What is a microcontroller versus a microprocessor? A very common, I think, question that many people still do not clearly uh, understand. The microprocessor is always the core. Okay, like I said, the one that does the important aspect of decoding and executing the instruction. Okay, fetch, decode, execute the instruction. That main uh, core functionality is handled by the microprocessor. Okay, so in our case, it is the Cortex M0 plus core. Okay, so if you ever want to build your own computing platform, you will take a microprocessor core, correct? And then you can build your own system by integrating all the other peripherals. So the bare minimum you need is what? The bare minimum you need is you need some memory. Okay, you need the clock. Okay, you need the clock, you need Clock, you need memory and you need uh, power. Okay, so the power is not mentioned here, but you can think of it as part of the system. Okay, the bare minimum you need to get a system up and running is you need power. And besides the core, you need, you need power, you need memory, and you need a clock. All right, but that is still the main microprocessor core itself, okay, to get the system running. If you talk about a microcontroller, you want to integrate other peripheral subsystems to build up a solution that can now interact with the physical world. Okay, so that is where you need analog A to D, D to A, you need timers, you need communication to talk to other devices and so on. Okay, so again, these are these peripheral subsystems, all that you see here, you can keep on adding and adding a lot of different types. Okay, but the whole idea is when everything comes together in a single chip solution, like what you have for your Arduino, all right, and the same thing for our KL25Z, what you get is a single chip solution. All right, with everything integrated. All right, then you can, of course, go back to the fundamental, which is the microprocessor core, and build up on your own as well. But when you build up on your own, then you need to integrate everything yourself. Okay, so again, most companies that are just dealing with solutions, okay, they have very short turnaround time, they don't have big budget to do heavy R&D investment, then they will go with a microcontroller option. Okay, whereas companies that have the, the, the schedule, the financial resources to support 
they might go with the microprocessor option and then build their own processor cost or their own microcontroller chipset okay to support a particular application all right so the microcontroller option is always very good for for students or for many projects because you can just pick one that sort of has everything that you need and you can quickly get started all right so it's of course a very uh, convenient solution for us okay now the attributes and parallel systems is concurrent reactive behavior all right so one of the important thing is real time response okay this real time response is again uh, a subjective to the application that we are talking about okay. so real time okay again most people sometimes think that real time is the fastest okay which is not the case okay real time basically mean i must fulfill my deadline okay that is the whole idea of real time when i press a button the led must light up that is my requirement but what is the deadline must the led light up within 1 second 10 seconds 10 minutes that is up to me to define for the system correct so if i say that my led must respond within 10 minutes after i press the switch as long as the led light up within 10 minutes i am still going to say it's a real time system okay because it can fulfill the requirements of the system in real time so real time is not the fastest it is to make sure that i can fulfill the deadline okay so that is the important thing you must understand huh? real time is not always the fastest it is the deadline that we specify as the requirements of the system okay and of course when you talk about real time you also talk about concurrency that means many things might happen at the same time and i must be able to fulfill the requirement of all these things okay that are happening at the same time all right so within the microcontroller itself all right we already have okay even without introducing an os into the system we already have concurrency why because if you recall back your epb1 epb2 we have used for example gpio interrupt okay which is a form of concurrency because you are busy with something else but when the interrupt comes in you are able to handle it all right we have talked about the uart interrupt so we have gpio with interrupt we have seen before we also have used uart with interrupt as well in epp all right that means i am busy with something some data comes in from the serial port i am able to respond so that is also concurrency okay and while i am handling all of this i can still move my motors because i have my timers to generate pwm okay so we already have been exposed to this concept of concurrency okay but that has been purely from the hardware uh, resources that are available in the controller all right so when we introduce a operating system on top of this hardware we are now adding more firepower okay that means now we are able to handle many many tasks in with, with concurrency at the software level itself without explicitly depending on separate hardware okay so when i use hardware like for example i use one of my timer block to generate a pwm then i'm limited by the number of timer blocks i have okay so if i use gpio interrupt i'm also limited by the number of gpio pins that can have interrupt capability okay whereas if i am able to utilize it from a software perspective there is literally no limit all right is is basically the limit is how much memory you have okay, how big can your code be all right so in that sense this real time capability when is transferred over to the software side by using an os you your system is now a lot more powerful all right so that is what we're going to be looking at all right so this is just to give you the idea of the hardware uh, concept okay so for example in my software i can have a timer that starts and the timer will interrupt so this could be a interval okay maybe every for example 4 seconds every 4 seconds i have a timer interrupt and every time the timer interrupt i start the a to d conversion and the a to d conversion will generate for example four interrupts so i take four readings 
Okay, and then I say ADC done. And then again, I start the next timer interrupt. Next timer interrupt and so on. So this is a way of having concurrency, some real time capability without even using uh, OS at the moment. All right, I can use my peripheral blocks, generate timer, uh, generate interrupts, okay? And using the timer as well, and have some real time capability. Okay, so fault handling and uh, diagnostics are things you will discuss more later on. Okay, constraints, I think uh, every embedded system will have constraints, all right? Uh, whether in terms of cost, the size, the power, and so on. Okay, so how much battery life it can, can sustain. Okay, these are things that you need to be aware of. All right. Uh, okay, so microcontroller, like I said, that's what we use mostly. Programming, rather, most of it is going to be in C. Okay, and I think some of you have been messaging me about the, the C programming part. Okay, so spend some time to go and read up on C. I mean, is this the syntax that is different? I think whatever other language you have learned, whether it's Python or, or Java, the, the logical thinking wise is still the same. All right, so it's just a matter of picking up the syntax and I think you should be fine. All right, so the OS part is what we'll be doing a bit later on. All right, so this uh, embed, uh, so this target board, the Freedom KL25Z board, uh, like I mentioned, is a very powerful board. Okay, uh, and this board is uh, compatible with embed. Okay, so let me show you what is this embed all about. All right, so you have an idea. Okay, so this embed is, uh, is an OS created by ARM itself. Okay, it's created by ARM itself, okay, and uh, it supports a wide range of uh, microcontrollers, and one of them is the KL25Z. All right. So initially, when I transitioned from uh, Arduino to uh, this KL25Z, I thought of using the embed OS. Okay, I thought of using the embed OS. Okay, but I did not do it. All right. Uh, why? Okay, let me show you why. Mm. Write a sample program. Okay, so this is the uh, embed platform, all right? And I'm going to just show you the program. So if you look at the program, the sample code, okay, using the embed OS, okay. What do you see? You see that if I go in this direction of using embed OS, it defeats the whole purpose of trying to learn something new. Because again, everything is abstracted at a very, very high level. Okay, so it becomes similar to Arduino. All right, everything is abstracted and you don't really understand what is going on. All right, so that is why we did not go in this direction. All right, so you're going to be learning it from the very low level ground up. Okay, so that is why we are going in the direction of the KL uh, IDE platform plus the RTX uh, OS. Okay, so it's a very powerful board, but like I said, just be very careful and take good care of it. Okay, so uh, admin stuff. Okay, so this one, I will send your announcement later as well. All right, on where to register. If you already have a team, okay, and you want to register, you can go ahead and register. Like I said, you do not need to rush. Okay, you have this week and next week to look around and form a team and register. All right. Uh, if by end of week two you are unable to register, that means you cannot form a team. All right, then I will be able to uh, assign you all after I gather your names. All right, so this one, uh, I do not think anybody is stuck overseas for the whole semester. I know some of you are uh, currently not in Singapore. All right, but you will be coming into Singapore either next week or week after and so on. All right, so if that is the case, all right, and for those, uh, I will send out another announcement for you all to send me your details. 
But if there's anybody who, who is permanently going to be stuck for the whole semester overseas, all right, because you cannot get a flight in, all right, and, and you cannot get approval to come in, then uh, we need to look at how to manage that from the project wise. Okay, so again, please choose your teammates wisely. All right, because you're going to be working with them the whole semester, all right, and you need to work together. All right, for those of you who do not have a partner, like I said, I will give your time until end of week two first, and then I will gather your information and form the team for you. All right, so don't worry, all right, about, about this. Okay, next Friday. Uh, 20th August. Okay, so you come to the lab according to the lab schedule. If you are already registered with a team, I will give you, I mean, the TA will be able to issue you your entire project kit. Okay, regardless of whether you have the team or don't have the team, each of you will receive one board for yourself. Okay, so everybody will get to draw out one board next week. All right. If your team is already registered in Luminous, then you will also get the project kit. Okay, but, that, but again, you do not need to worry. You're not going to lose out if you don't collect it next week. Okay? The official lab that is starting in week three is still only using the bot only. Okay, you'll only start to use the items in the kit later on. Okay, once you collect the bot next week, next Friday, okay, you must do lab one. Okay, lab one is very easy. You don't need to do soldering. You don't need to do anything. You just need to make sure that the board is working. All right. So I've given you the instructions in the lab manual. Follow those steps and ensure that the board is working. If there are any issues with the board, you must inform the TA. The TA can do a one-to-one -one swap for you. you. First, the TA will have to check all right, that you are following, you have followed the steps. If everything is checked and the board is still not working, then we'll do a swap for you. All right, so you need to do this before leaving the lab next week. Okay, those of you who, for example, on MC, uh, stay home notice, whatever, cannot come to the lab next week. If you want uh, somebody else to collect for you, you just ask the person to collect for you and you will inform the TA. All right, then they can collect the board for you. All right, but you must make sure that you check this uh, Check the board before leaving the lab. So if your friend is collecting for you, your friend has to check your board as well. Okay, so let me repeat that. Huh? So next week when you collect the board, whether it's for yourself and for your friends as well, you need to check the board before you leave the lab. Okay, once you leave the lab, okay, we will assume that the board you collected is working. That means lab one is running without any issue. Okay. Okay, so I think that brings us to the end uh, of the lecture. Okay, so let's let me just do a quick poll to uh, get your understanding of something that we discussed today. Okay. So the poll is still active. You just submit your result first. Okay, so let me just show the responses. Okay, so majority says false. Okay, uh, okay, so again, this is just, uh, I think the key thing is, is always better. Hardware solutions like FPGA are very good. Okay, they're very good for specific uh, applications. 
All right. Uh, so in the past, uh, I mean, we still have, but uh, maybe not as popular as before. Last time, we used to have this thing called uh, DSP chips, digital signal processing chips, which were very popular, all right, uh, because they were designed specifically for DSP type applications. That means those that involve a lot of signal processing. All right, but I think nowadays more and more microcontrollers are really very powerful that they also have uh, similar hardware blocks within themselves. All right, so, uh, so hardware solutions like FPGAs are very good, okay, for very targeted solutions, okay. Um, whereas microcontroller and software solutions are good when you have uh, situations where you have uh, requirements that are evolving, that are changing, and you will need to keep updating. All right. Whereas FPGAs, uh, you know exactly that this is the, the, the problem you want to solve, and you want to do it in the fastest possible way. All right. Uh, so in some cases, like I said, even the processor design is done using FPGA first, okay, and then you move on to AC. So uh, it, it's a very good solution, but it's a very targeted solution. Whereas microcontroller plus software gives you a lot more flexibility, all right, in the long run. Okay. Okay, so this one also we discussed just now. So just to make sure you have a recap of it. So if I have a input and output uh, parameters that are non-linear, how will you write the code for it? Okay, please mirror function. Click the segments lookup table. Divide the segments. Okay, equations. Okay, sorry. Split the segments. Yeah. So so that's the general idea, right? You want to split into segments, create specific equations, all right, and, and look at it, okay, and yeah, you want to segment it, right, so I think, yeah, so as long as you understand the general idea is good, okay, so you know how to handle it if you ever face with such a situation. Okay, so this is the last question. The Freedom Board has a 32-bit Cortex microcontroller. So what exactly is 32-bit and what is the purpose of it? All right, I mean, you see this everywhere, correct? You see it's a 8-bit microcontroller, 16-bit controller, 32-bit controller. So what is 32-bit and what is the significance? Number of bits that can be processed, processing power. Can access more memory. Can do more stuff. Length of instructions. Memory addresses. Okay. Uh, some of you are getting the idea. I guess some of you may still be a bit unsure. Okay, so what exactly is 32-bit, okay? It is generally referring to the amount of data you can process at any point of time. Okay, and what does that relate to? That means if I say I can process 32 bits of data at any point of time, that means internally all my registers are 32-bit. That means I can hold 32 bits of data at a time and process it at every single time. Okay, so that is the significance of it. That means I'm able to process 32 bits of data each time. Okay, so that's the processing power of it. Okay, whether, okay, the, the ability to access memory 
is dependent on another thing. So this 32 bit is generally what you call the data bus of a system. The memory access, how much memory I can access or the number of memory addresses that I'm able to access, that is dependent on another bus called the address bus. Okay, so the address bus need not be 32 bit, it could be 64 bit. Okay, or it could be any number of bits depending on how much addressing space I have in my system. Okay, but 32 bit is the amount of data I can process at any point of time. Okay, so we will talk more about this in next lesson. All right, where we are going to look a bit more in depth into the actual controller and the internal architecture. All right, so next week, okay, we will continue to understand a bit more of uh, software development and then we will move on to the Cortex microcontroller and understand how, uh, what it, how it is designed from the internal perspective. Okay, so let me see. That all. Yeah, that's all. All right, so I will see you all uh, next week, okay, where we will follow up. And uh, we will first follow up on the software side and then from there you move on to the uh, in-depth review of the hardware architecture. Okay. Um, yeah. So I will be sending out some announcements later for the project uh, as well as the lab. All right. So please look out for those announcements. Uh, and uh, and if you have any other questions, feel free to contact me. Okay. So thank you very much, and I'll see you all uh, next week.